Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Science Faction. The only show where a scientist, a comedian, and a comedian scientist come together to discuss science. Comedically. Hello, and welcome to Science Faction 95, Science Faction Americium. Hell yeah, bro. I'm sure I'm mispronouncing that slightly, but Americium sounds like the <laughs> sweetest name ever. Was this a NASA plot to get Americans more interested in science? So this was discovered here in the United States, of course. And uh, before, europium, which is also on the lanthide elements, and it's right next to it, was discovered. So they're like, all right, we're going to up it. I see your europium. I raise you an americium. Do we beat polonium, the Polish element? I I think we should beat polonium. It seems like only (laughs) fair, right? (laughs) But it is very interesting, uh, like all the elements up there at the top, it is radioactive, but it's one of the very few radioactive materials you probably come within a few feet of every single day. Can either of you guess where you would come in contact with Americium? The White House. Yes, you're around the White House every day. Before you go to work, you take a stop by 1600 Pennsylvania Ave, cruise on by, wave hi to Barack, and then head on back. The White House is inside all of our hearts as Americans. (laughs) As a racist, I agree with you. I believe all houses should be white. (laughs) What about you, Mike? You can guess how we pass by a bit of an Americium every single day? I have no idea. The answer is that is what is in your smoke detectors. And they're very good at that application, much better than competing technology. And they mainly emit alpha waves, which are low danger and easily contained, not the more dangerous gamma rays. Talk to Dr. Banner about that. Yeah. Those will will ruin your life. So could I build a dirty bomb if I bought like a thousand smoke detectors? Hold the question. Very Asian question, and we're about to get to why. (laughs) So though they don't emit gamma rays themselves, they can decay eventually into other elements throughout time, which do emit gamma rays. So in the end, they actually can be slightly dangerous, if not properly shielded. Things to remember is it's a very tiny amount in your smoke detector, which is why we don't usually worry about it. But it's actually dangerous in large quantities. Americium can be quite dangerous. But it's just such tiny amounts that we all kind of look the other way. Everyone except David Hahn, the radioactive Boy Scout. So Hahn, guess ethnicity... (laughs) was a Boy Scout who was fascinated by chemistry and spent years conducting amateur chemistry experiments, which sometimes resulted in small explosions and other mishaps. He was inspired in part by reading the Golden Book of Chemistry Experiments and tried to collect samples of every element in the periodic table, including the radioactive ones. I would have loved that. Some FBI agent's like, excuse me, why are you trying to get enriched uranium? (laughs) Listen, I've got a collection. (laughs) I I treat elements like Pokemon. Yeah, got to collect them all. So he later received a merit badge in atomic energy and became fascinated with the idea of creating a breeder reactor in his home. Han diligently amassed this radioactive material by collecting small amounts of household products such as americium for smoke detectors, thorium from camping lantern mantles, radium from clocks, and tritium from gun sights. His reactor was a bored-out block of lead, and he used lithium from $1,000 worth of purchased batteries to purify the thorium ash using a Bunsen burner. Han then posed as an adult scientist or high school teacher to gain the trust of many professionals in letters and was able to amass all this stuff by basically pretending to be somebody he wasn't when he was just like a 16-year-old kid uh, trying to build a nuclear reactor in his backyard. Is a breeder reactor a reactor that does not produce electricity for homosexual reactors? That's right. (laughs) Breeder reactor obviously uses the larger elements that it produces, allows you to get a lot more bang for your buck from that uh, nuclear reaction. Although his homemade nuclear reactor never came anywhere near reaching critical mass, it ended up emitting dangerous levels of radioactivity. Alarmed, Han began to dismantle his experiments, but a chance encounter with police led to the discovery of his activities, and they basically had to turn his old house into like a FEMA cleanup site. (laughs) This is a bunch of radioactivity and stuff. Did he Uh, have to mail back the merit badge? (laughs) <laughs> and the sash it came on <laughs> super interesting stuff they uh he ended up going on to uh to steal a bunch of smoke detectors out of an apartment building to try and do it again like he was just <laughs> living in an apartment building and he just started stealing the smoke detectors and they go who would want these <laughs> that fire killed 17 puppies and a baby <laughs> yeah. so very very interesting you can collect enough smoke detectors apparently to start doing some nuclear stuff in your backyard so uh isis have at it <laughs> All right, guys. I, of course, am your host, archaeologist and comedian Robert Timothy. With me, as always, is my comedian, Mr. Damien Mercado. Damien, how are you doing tonight? I'm doing great. Feeling a lot less successful. By 16, I was only doing half that. Yeah. you. <laughs> not only had you not gotten a reactor going by the time you were 16, you hadn't even begun the process. 
I couldn't even get a reaction from my father. Like, <laughs> I will give negative attention. <laughs> and speaking of negative attention, we have none other than our scientist with our bio background. Mike, how are you doing today? Doing great, thanks. Mike, I heard you got called something really interesting today. What was that? <laughs> uh, I was told I was an attractive man for an Oriental. Oh, what a great compliment you got. That's fantastic. <laughs> but when you said it, it was like you found an insult somewhere yeah, in there. Like, I'm not sure how you took offense to that. Yeah. This lady was trying to tell you you're an attractive dude. He's being as unreasonable as that Negro woman earlier. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Of course, we're here broadcasting from the Madhouse Comedy Club along the skyline of beautiful downtown San Diego. Come on to check out some of the greatest headliners touring the nation. Also, in between our shows and checking out Madhouse, if you get your science jonesing on, go ahead and go to our website, www.thesciencefaction.com. Figure out all the articles coming out during the week and some witty headlines to go along with them. Let's move right in, guys, to science articles. From molecules to particles, this is Science Articles. Some super interesting articles came out this week, guys. I'm psyched to have Mike here to discuss some of the bio aspects of it. The first one especially, really, really interesting, tapeworm cancer... Guys, a Colombian man has caught his tapeworm's cancer. Terrible pet. Would you, <laughs> you watch the video, you're warned, don't get a tapeworm. Right. You're going to get their cancer. Yeah, it also does seem like an STD when he's saying it at that point. I caught their cancer. Don't tell anyone. <laughs> so tapeworms are, the one, are super common in areas with bad sanitation. But of the over 9,000 tapeworm species, this one, the dwarf tapeworm, is the only one that lives and breeds completely within the human digestive tract and the only tapeworm species that prefers the battle axe to the sword. It was named after the dwarf. Yeah, exactly. The, the scientist just named it. Just loved 80s straight to VHS comedy. Well, you missed my sweet dwarf reference at the end there, but that's fine. <laughs> so this particular patient also had HIV, which led to an impaired immune system, something that's been linked to other issues with tapeworms, because basically your immune system can't fight off the tapeworm on its own. The reason it's important that this particular species of tapeworm lives completely within the human gut is normally if you get a tapeworm, you have to get it from someplace else, then you excrete it, it breeds elsewhere, you keep that one tapeworm. Since this one breeds completely within the human body, it means that it lays its eggs inside the human body, and you have an ability to just basically have a continual cycle of tapeworms within you. So what, you only maintain ones? Like other tapeworms, like seats taken. Yeah, done. Gotta go to another one. Done. They literally do it like Forrest Gump. No seats such, taken. No such thing as a tapeworm roommate. No, That's what not I mean. <laughs> They're only studio apartments when it comes to tapeworms. <laughs> That's what your bowels are to a state tapeworm. People are very strict landlords. Incredibly strict landlords. Wait, wait, is that another tapeworm you got living in there? No. Evicted. <laughs> Boot them out. So because they can reproduce solely within this environment, it means there's a lot of individual tapeworms that come in contact with an individual who's infected, and it means that there's a lot of potential for problems. We know that cancer is the runaway cell growth of an individual. Basically, the same part of your body that heals you ends up killing you by growing cells out of control. We know that tapeworms can get cancer. We've seen that happen before in the lab where a tapeworm can have that same kind of thing, which, in, by the way, when they look at the genetics, is actually a very close simile to what causes cancer in humans. The gene deletion is very similar. So you have that gene deletion, all of a sudden a tapeworm gets cancer. We knew that happened. What we didn't know, what we've never seen before, what is absolutely crazy, is the idea that somehow this tapeworm's cancer ended up infecting the human host. We've never seen a cross-species cancer transfer. In fact, until recently, we had never seen cancer transferred from one individual to another. Now, that, that became a huge story a couple years back when Tasmanian devils began getting a, a contagious form of cancer on their faces. But again, that is from the same species. This is an interspecies mixing of catching cancer almost like an STD. I feel like there's a heartwarming spin on this. You know, like when you see like, a, like, a, like the owl and the cat, you know, buddies playing around. I feel like a guy in his tapeworm can bond over this cancer. <laughs> well, I don't know if he's going to bond so much over it because he did end up passing away before they figured out what had happened. He had just been a sick guy who used to have HIV. He didn't know what was wrong with him. He was in a hospital in Colombia. Of course, nobody's thinking that he caught tapeworm cancer. So they were doing this, this, uh, these crazy rounds of tests. They get the info back 72 hours before this guy dies on what the problem is, and he's unconscious and they can't tell him. So not only is it bad enough that he died from, from another animal's cancer, he didn't get the benefit of at least knowing he'd be the first person to know in history to do so. I mean, I can uh, understand Damien's surprise and his general lack of comprehension, but <laughs> I, I don't Me really too, understand Mike. what the big deal is. It's like the headline 
parasitic organism thrives in moist, warm, immunocompromised host. But it's not just the parasitic organism. It's their cancer. That's what's crazy. Having a tapeworm, eh, routine. Having tapeworms cancer that gets into you, nuts. Uh, there's all these questions. Like, how does that even work? How, do the, you know, how does it get nutrients? How is it able to, to morph to the human cells that are completely different, visibly different? You can tell it's different cells just by looking through a magnifying glass at these. Very, very interesting stuff. The man was riddled with tumors in his lungs, liver, and adrenal glands. Riddled is a kind of a, a nice word for a horrific thing to happen. <laughs> uh, in fact, the tumors on his lymph nodes grew so big that he was unable to freely move his neck. So we've, th- we've seen some, something that we've never seen before in science. Super interesting. And by the way, in case anybody's thinking about it, we still don't know how we would fight this because he died before we got the chance. You know, What do we use? Do we use chemotherapy that we would normally use for human cancer cells or antibiotics that we usually use for tapeworm cells? We could discourage very polite immune systems. Yeah, they can stay. Yeah, these cancer cells, fine. We'll hold your cancer cells for a little bit, tapeworm, but you got to be gone after a month. All right, yeah, here we are at the month. News at 11, Asian cancer rates spike. <laughs> so polite. <laughs> Those are some attractive Asian cancers. <laughs> the, you know, the other thing that uh, I think is surprising about this is that an immunocompromised person only had HIV, a tapeworm, and cancer. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure there were some rashes that were involved as well. <laughs> HIV, a tapeworm, and cancer go into a dude. <laughs> Stop me if you've heard this one before. All right, guys, a couple of questions for my panelists. Number one, how do you think the cells were able to establish themselves and attain nutrition from the host's body? I imagine they hung out with a uh, can along the blood vessels. Some of the more sympathizing red blood cells will, you know, throw some glucose and oxygen his way. So these are panhandling cells. (laughs) Yeah, again, have a very rude, conservative immune system, and this won't be a problem. All right, Mike, what do you think? How do you think they were able to tie in and get nutrients from cells that aren't even the same kingdom as them? Well, I, I would just kind of guess that after metastasizing, uh, it would spread through lymph or blood and end up clinging into certain places and growing there, just pulling nutrients from, from blood. Like uh, So they can do that? They can just pull the nutrients straight out of the cells of the other animal? Uh, well, if it's got access to a blood supply, I don't see yeah. why it couldn't just p- pull glucose and uh, electrolytes out of the blood. And I guess that's what tapeworms do in general, right? So if they, tapeworm cancer had some experience. <laughs> yeah. It had a grizzled past that allowed it to survive in this harsh situation. It was like the Martian, essentially. (laughs) Question number two. This discovery would seem to combine the three of the worst things that can happen to someone health-wise. Number one, tapeworm infection. Number two, HIV. Number three, cancer. Try to come up with the health hat trick that beats this. Well, first (laughs) off, I'd just like to say that uh, I don't see the tapeworm as being that bad. I think it's an awesome way to lose weight. Oh, (laughs) you're you're pro-tapeworm. That's right. You take a lot of supplements. I forgot about that. I took a week off from those, actually. How'd it go? I, I couldn't tell a difference. Yeah. We, need, we really need to do the double blind. If only the vitamin lobby had bought Mike off the same way the tapeworm <laughs> lobby apparently has. Or what would you think would be the hat trick that would beat out these three? I would say having a coarse personality, Tourette's, and a nerve condition that made your entire body feel like your testicles. So okay. any strike, <laughs> footstep, and pain... Okay. Since you're yelling Worst. hateful things about how attractive for an oriental mic is. <laughs> so your body is incredibly sensitive. And you're a jerk. You get punched a lot. You're, you're <laughs> a, a pathological asshole. <laughs> and you get, so basically you without the whole balls as a body thing. Yeah. <laughs> you're just imagining how horrible would my life be <laughs> if, I if I also had this one other thing. If I didn't wear a cup every day leaving the house, yes. If you have room for fourth trait, maybe join the UFC. Like, I want to be a UFC fighter. <laughs> You're like the Rudy, despite his crippling nerve condition, went on to be the best pugilist. Question number three. If this case repeats itself in another individual, how should we go about treating the cancer? Chemo is usually used against human cancer. Antibiotics are usually used against tapeworms. Should we use one of those or something else? you got to shrink people down, Fantastic Voyage style. Okay. So you're going to get people, shrink them down in a tiny spaceship, then they're going to mm-hmm. attack the cancer. What are they going to use once they get down to that size? Rear naked choke. Okay. We're going to so get that is... dude with the testicle thing, the right. UFC fighter. I'm, okay. I'm volunteering Damien to go in and do that with this coarse <laughs> sense of wit. <laughs> Uh, Damien would be a good uh, a good choice. The only problem is you usually have to do pretty well at I call BS to get on those missions. And Damien is pretty bad at that game. And How so, many fucking times must I win? I was like, won the last three one, times. One would be nice. But anyway, Mike, what do you think would be a good way to treat this cancer? I think it's going to be a it would be a blend of uh, 
uh, both chemo and uh, antibiotics. Yeah, because I think you'd have to be able to attack the actual cells of the of the tapeworm. But at the same point, I wonder if it would actually in- cause regular human cells to become cancerous or, or metastasize and grow out of, of whack. Because if you think about it, at some point, when they're connecting to the lining of your stomach or whatever and trying to get nutrients out of you, they're interacting with your cells in some way. I wonder if you would have an increased risk of human cancer and you would need both because you might be trying to treat with chemo out of control human growth. What if you treat it with another bigger parasite like a leech? Yeah, and then eventually you're just shoving a mongoose down that guy's throat, <laughs> pulling it out by the tail. Don't come out till the cobra's gone. I don't know if your HMO covers this, but yeah, yeah and mouth—that's where it's oh, going. Oh, it does. It's, it's under Ricky Ticky Tabby. It's a little line on the side of him. All right, guys, let's go on to article number two. This one is, of course, right after my heart. It turns out Borat is up to something more than just killing those dick-faced Saiga antelope. Over fifty <laughs> ancient geoglyphs, which are ground drawings like the famous Nazca lines, have been found in Kazakhstan using Google Earth, and these measure between 90 to 400 meters in size. We're talking 1,200-foot-long geoglyphs that can really only be seen from the sky. Sacha Baron Cohen really commits to a joke when he does this. (laughs) Surprise announcement for Borat, too. (laughs) Google Earth advertisement for Borat, only discovered now. These are amazing, guys. I've, I study these. This is one of my wheelhouses in archaeology. I do a lot of work down here in the Southwest with uh, geoglyphs. They're very interesting because they're hard to see from the ground. A lot of times they're essentially invisible from the ground, and you can only see them from the air. In this case, we're using satellite imagery, Google Earth, and then you're going in later with archaeologists to do excavation, to do study, try and figure out what's going on with this culture, how old it is. Some of the archaeologists try and put some of these geoglyphs at around 8,000 years old, though luminescence testing has, seems to put it around 2,000 years old. Even then, these are huge, gigantic geoglyphs in the middle of Kazakhstan that are otherwise unexplained. I mean, we think of the Nazca lines, you go like, oh, you know, the Nazca lines, those must be ancient. They're probably newer than that. It's arguable because it's hard to date them, but probably around that same time to newer than that. So these are very ancient geoglyphs in this big area. We don't know necessarily what they're for. It could be something where you bring somebody to the surrounding hillsides and look at this amazing thing, look how powerful we are. That's what we think one of the reasons the Nazca lines are. It could be a demarcation, you know, go that way until you see that big giant circle and then turn the other thing. We're not necessarily sure, but to me, these have always been super fascinating because it requires a significant amount of effort in order to do this. Most of them require some kind of math mathematical or geometric knowledge. When you talk about the level of effort, going through Google Earth and the yes. click dragging, I could understand how you get a, probably get a cramp in your That's finger right. after a while. <laughs> I was more talking about the building of it 2,000 years ago, which surprisingly did not use Google Earth. <laughs> they were just walking out there in Kazakhstan. So it takes a lot of effort. So there's probably a younger brother to whoever did this who always felt envious that he was the lazy one. <laughs> Smoked a lot of pot on the couch. That's right. There's some interesting pictures. These are really, really neat. If you go to our website, guys, we'll have some pictures of them for you. An international team of researchers from the Lithuanian Institute of History in Kazakhstan, which, by the way, side note, I do think it's funny when your own country has another country's university in it. It's the Lithuanian University in Kazakhstan. And not only that, it's not like the British University in Kazakhstan. Like, <laughs> hey, let's go down to the Baltics and then put one over in Kazakhstan. Maybe the Lewi- I don't know if this helps the case. Maybe the Lithuanian University is the European University of Phoenix. They have satellite branches all over. Uh, Yeah, they're the national university over there in Kazakhstan. So like I said, there are some discrepancies on the dates. I tend to go by luminescence testing. I I feel that's a little bit more valid. So I'd say probably around 2,000 years old, maybe a little bit older. What is uh, luminescence testing? Basically, you're able to tell when the last time a rock or something else was exposed to sunlight. So in the case of that, we're usually using beryllium, I believe, as the element that gets created when quartz rock is exposed to sunlight. To Great a show, degree. by the way. Well, we've... <laughs> and then once it gets turned over and it's no longer being exposed to the sunlight and beryllium isn't being produced anymore, we can measure the, the difference in elements and tell how long ago that rock was turned over. It's a much more recent dating method. It's only been around for about five years. It's very, very accurate, though, and very good to like, use in situations like this for geoglyphs. Like J-Date, it is a relatively recent dating <laughs> That's <survey>. right. <laughs> Archaeological excavations at the sites uncovered remains of structures and at the geoglyphs suggesting that rituals took place there. We don't know what these are for, like I said, but it does seem like there was some rituals going on. It does seem like there was some utilization. Maybe afterwards, maybe this was the purpose for it. Regardless, we do know that there were activities associated with these people going on at the time. A couple of questions for my panelists. Number one. Why do you think ancient civilizations around the world dedicated so much time and effort to build these geoglyphs? 
This is before the movie Independence Day. We had to let aliens know what's up. You know, if you're coming here, you're going to get conquered. Look, we could do these massive right. this is ground our, paintings. This is our version of Randy Quaid flying the plane up <laughs> into the ship. It's a prehistoric forefather, too. It's weird that we don't have a geoglyph of Randy Quaid flying <laughs> the plane into the ship, right? Zoom out. Yeah. Keep zooming out. <laughs> what about you, Mike? What do you think that people used all this time, effort, energy, and cultures where all of that was very valuable, instead of pushing it toward survival, they did it toward making these geoglyphs. Uh, I'm gonna guess that this was kind of the, a cultural dick measuring contest. The Peruvians oh, like, oh yeah. look what we've got. Kazakhstan. Mm, yeah. I don't know. There's some big ones in Siberia that seem yep. even older. Maybe they were the same way. Yeah, that's an awesome geoglyph, but you still have to live in Kazakhstan. I'll yeah. take Peru. <laughs> and question number three. These sites were found using Google Earth. What Lazy you, archaeologists. Yeah, I know, right? What do you think will be the next thing found using unconventional archaeological technology? Somebody will use Google Earth to see somebody using Apple Maps. <laughs> <laughs> he seems to be having a harder time. <laughs> I think there's special sites for all those Google, uh, the, the Street View gaffes, where people are just you know, urinating in the street and stuff right, like that. Right, of course. <laughs> all right, and Mike, what do you think will be the next technology used to find something unexpected in archaeology? Uh, I'd love to see a return to the days of a shovel and pickaxe. <laughs> I, I <laughs> use a shovel like, like on using a your hands, basis. maybe, and not to click a mouse. We, we do lazy archaeologists. We do that on a weekly basis, Mike. How dare you? You're less attractive for an Asian mouse. <laughs> 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 All right, let's move right on to the things we thought we knew. The things we thought we knew, because sometimes old science, like old people, is worthless and wrong. All right, guys, this is The Things We Thought We Knew, where we look at something that science seemingly got wrong. So this episode, very, very interesting thing. I have been following this for a while. I am crazy interested in it because, well, I think you'll find out. It's, uh, it's called EM Drive, and it's a seemingly impossible engine, which defies the laws of physics as we know it, which was essentially invented in the early 2000s by, a, by an aerospace engineer. By See, a mad aerospace engineer. Right. <laughs> Seems to defy the laws of physics as we know it, and yet... It seems to produce thrust, very minute amounts of thrust, in certain tests. There's a very fine line between mad and genius. Right. <laughs> so I, I want to take you guys back to the early 2000s. This engineer comes up with this idea for this particular engine, this particular drive. He builds a facsimile of it, and he starts testing it, and seems to get results of positive thrust that defy the laws of physics. I'll get into why in a little bit, but seem to defy the laws of physics. He keeps telling everybody it becomes this internet sensation, and like so many hoaxes of that time period that were in the early 2000s when internet broadband expanded, it was kind of ignored. Well, this guy kept pushing. He was one of the few people who wasn't just some random uh, mechanic building it in his garage. He had some experience, he had some ideas, and he seemed to be able to do what he was saying he could do. If he put that same effort towards his perpetual motion machine, we could have solved a lot That's more right. problems. <laughs> the Chinese caught on. They started working on it. Some other groups caught on. They started working on it. Eventually, a few years ago, NASA was like, well, you keep saying you get positive tests. Let's give it a shot, which usually ends within the first day of NASA, with NASA going, yeah, you, you didn't, you didn't, it didn't work. It didn't <laughs> Why do work. we keep going out to these yeah. things? They never <laughs> succeed. Well, this time it did. NASA built a fully functioning model. They started testing it in the, at their facilities, and they're registering a small amount of thrust. It's amazing. Now, we're not sure it's so small that this thrust could technically be an artifact of the testing itself. It is not 100% definitive yet, but this is the second round of testing this has gone through in NASA. And in both rounds, they have found that this seemingly physically impossible engine is producing thrust. This is nuts. So the EM drive is a thruster that uses no fuel. It uses a magnetron, a high-powered vacuum tube, where the interaction between magnetic fields and electrons generates microwaves. And a nemesis to Megatron. <laughs> <laughs> the magnetron sends microwaves into a truncated cone, hitting the short end and, according to the proponents of the technology, generating thrust. So imagine this. Imagine a, uh, a cylinder that's tapered, so smaller on one end than the other. You put a magnetron inside that, which constantly shoots out microwaves. The microwaves are hitting it. If you Instead, you take out uh, microwaves and you did water, right? Imagine water jets shooting out. By hitting the small end of the cone, it would all get forced out the back end of the cone, and you would have some thrust forward. That's essentially what's going on with these microwaves. Now, you might think, okay, that makes sense. Here's the problem. Physically, that's impossible. It defies the laws of thermodynamics because... It's third law. Yeah, you have to have something you're pushing off of. But the way rockets work, the way any kind of propulsion works, you're pushing something behind you in order to get the momentum to go forward. In this case, there is no physical mass moving backwards. So it seems to defy the laws of physics that it would work. 
Do you think this scientist on day one of his physics class, they handed him a rule book and he literally threw it out the he window? He threw it out the window and then they tried to assign him a partner who played by the rules. <laughs> also played by Danny Glover. Yeah. Man, he would have worked out too if he just didn't have seven days to retirement. <laughs> Should really get longer term partners. He's getting too old for this shit. The supposed thrust is small on the order of a micro Newton. So unaccounted for phenomenon could be mimicking thrust, and such a small force might not seem useful for space travel, but it would be significant when scaled up to a spacecraft. If the EM drive becomes a reality, some say it could be used to reach the end of the solar system in months instead of decades. So it's always interesting to see legitimate scientific mysteries like this. For everyone who thinks that there are engines that run on water or other magical claims, this is what would happen if you were right. NASA would be the first one to test it, and once they test it, they would be the first one to say, everybody look at this! Something's going on! We can't explain it! I think this is a great uh, thing, not only because it's a mystery, but because of the example of how the scientific community handles actual mysteries as opposed to pseudoscience ones. But it's also great because it reminds us, especially those in the scientific field, that there are still unexplained mysteries out there. I think this is an old article. I remember hearing about the EDM drive at uh, Burning Man. Oh, yeah. It's almost (laughs) the same thing. All right, guys, let's move right on. To I call BS. I call. I call. I call. I call. I call. I call. Ring, ring. I call BS. Okay, guys, I call BS is the game in which I read four science articles to my panelists, some of which are true and some of which are BS, standing for bad science, and they compete to see which ones can tell the real from the fake. Are you guys ready to play? Let's do it. You keep forgetting to mention the unofficial rule where you work to sabotage me. I usually try as hard as possible to make you look less like a fool, Damien, but it turns out that's one thing you work real hard at. (laughs) All right, guys. I'm the best. (laughs) Article number one. A new study suggests that it's not the chlorine that makes your eyes red in the pool. It's all the sweat and pee. Article number two. A new study suggests that kangaroo farts are more dangerous than previously thought. Article number three. A new study suggests that the Permian extinction affected land animals more than sea animals. And lastly, number four, a new study suggests firstborn children are less likely to need glasses. All right, guys, it is a punch out for the decade. As last I remember, Mike beat Damien like a small redheaded stepchild. We tied with perfect scores. That is such bullshit. Stop copying me. As we know, the tie goes to the scientist. That's the rule, Damien. You lost badly. All right, let's see if you can flip that around this time. Article number one, a new study suggests that it's not the chlorine that makes your eyes red in the pool. It's all the sweat and pee. Damien, is this science or bad science? This is science, and even the soothing effect of all the semen in the water can't counteract it. (laughs) That's why you run to the bathroom afterwards. (laughs) Most chemical stations, uh, if you work with hazardous chemicals, just pipes in horse semen or something. You are not invited to my pool. (laughs) (laughs) All right, and Mike. Uh, Bad science, I believe this is a uh, reactions uh, of the chlorine reacting with whatever's in the water that's producing the the red eyes. All right, and article number two. A new study suggests that kangaroo farts are more dangerous than previously thought. Damien, is this science or bad science? This is science. Just ask Steve Irwin. He was killed by a stingray. Days later, he was stabbed coincidentally <laughs> in the heart. Oh, but, yeah. <laughs> but, but are you saying that the kangaroo parts are actually what killed him? And this was it was just it was played off it as was, if it was a stingray. It was a slow kill, okay. six, about six days or so. Few people know that kangaroo farts up your chances of stingray to the heart exponentially. <laughs> what do you think attracted the stingray? <laughs> All right, and Mike. I don't see how kangaroo farts could be that dangerous, especially considering we've been locked in a small room with Damien for the past 40 minutes. I'm going to say bad signs. All right. Article number three, a new study suggests that the Permian extinction affected land animals more than sea animals. Damien, is this science or bad science? This is bad science. And most dolphins also believe that Mike is very attractive for an oriental. (laughs) Fair enough. Mike, what do you think? Do you think that a new study suggests that the Permian extinction affected land animals more than sea animals? I'm not a rug, damn it. I'm going to go ahead and say this is science. And article number four, a new study suggests firstborn children are less likely to need glasses. Damien, is this science or bad science? I'm going to say this is bad science. It's only younger siblings who wear glasses as a defense mechanism because you're not supposed to hit somebody in the face who wears glasses. Older siblings have no need to throw glasses on. And Mike? I'm going to go ahead and guess bad science Mm -hmm. as perhaps uh, firstborn children have poor nutrition. Okay. My brother's four inches taller than me. That's all I'm saying. (laughs) (laughs) All right, guys. Let's go back and see how they did. Follow along at home and see how you did. Article number one, a new study suggests that it's not the chlorine that makes your eyes red in the pool. It's all of the sweat and pee. Damien says true. Mike says false. And the answer is bad science. Still not invited to my pool, Damien. You don't have to consent. 
That's it's fine. bad science. Mike got it exactly right. Uh, you'll see a bunch of science article headlines that get it wrong. It'll say it's pee and sweat. But as Mike pointed out, and the technicality to this one is that it's actually the chlorine binding to biological agents like pee and sweat that form chemical irritants to your eyes. So when you see people say it's the chlorine or when you see somebody say it's sweat and pee, they're both wrong and uh, both right, I guess. So it's half, half full, half empty. Article number two, a new study suggests that kangaroo farts are more dangerous than previously thought. Damien thinks this is true. Mike thinks this is false. And this one is science. Crocky. Kangaroo toots have been considered easy on the environment because they've been thought to contain little to no methane. But a wildlife biologist at the University of Australia and colleagues showed that a single kangaroo can produce nearly 1,000 liters of methane per year. That's not a lot compared to, like, cows who can do 250 to 500 liters a day, but it is a lot more than previously thought. When you showed up at the lab that morning, was it a punishment? Guess who's testing kangaroo parts today? <laughs> What's the reward? <laughs> hey, Bill, good, good job on the last paper. Guess who's testing the softness of kangaroo vaginas today? <laughs> Article number three. A new study suggests that the Permian extinction affected land animals more than it did sea animals. Damien thinks this is false, and Mike thinks this is true, and this one is bad science. Woo! A suspected colossal die-off of roughly 70% of land species did not accompany the Permian extinction 252 million years ago. Uh, might be some issue. We know we've talked about archaea possibly causing that by uh, creating a bunch of methane that, along with volcanoes, basically warmed up the planet and, and caused a huge problem that killed 95% of creatures living on Earth. Two fart articles in a row. Very mature. Yeah. <laughs> but maybe there was something about uh, not living on land, being in the water, that made it much worse. So uh, it turns out that Permian extinction does not appear to have affected land animals nearly as much as water animals. And lastly, a new study suggests that firstborn children are less likely to need glasses. Damien thinks this is true, and Mike thinks this is false, and this one is bad science, meaning that Mike takes it with the tie! Yet again. Good this is such job, a terrible Mike. rule! Mike, you did fantastically. There was never a doubt in my mind. <laughs> uh, you continue to just smash, just smash on him so brutally. It's not so much that I would bet on myself so much just... As much as I just bet against, bet against Damien. Damien. Yes. That's always a good way to go. I'm fighting back with passive resistance. <laughs> I'm just going to be dead weight when Meaning you carry me out Meaning you're going to lay there and take it. I like that. <laughs> Please stop, Mike, <laughs> with your long driving thrust. Uh, after controlling for age and sex, the researchers saw that first children were about 12% more likely to be nearsighted than second children. Very, very interesting. Probably not necessarily genetics. It could have something to do with education. Earlier research suggests that parents spend more resources on educating their oldest children than on other kids. You're not supposed to poke your child's eye. Huh. <laughs> you know, you're, that's why the first kid's uh, the do-over kid. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And so it could be that we are putting people in myopic conditions that are straining their eyes. It could be a lot of things, but a weird situation because 12%, that's a significant result. 12% is a legitimately significant result. And saying that you have a 12% higher likelihood of needing glasses if you're an older child, they need to look into this. There's, there's some pretty interesting stuff going on there. Maybe you should be grateful if you really can pull off glasses. Like I, I just seem like a pretentious ass if I right. wear glasses, but if right. I... But if it was LeBron. All right, guys. Smart I'm just trying to picture scientists like us. Well, not like you, Damien. Yeah. Uh, coming up with a parenting book. Animal husbandry is a science. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Let's move right on to our final segment, Noble Nerds. Welcome to Noble Nerds, where we honor Noble Laureates, the world's most educated virgins. All right, in this segment, our comedian, Mr. Damien Mercado, takes a look at a specific Nobel Prize winner in history and tells us all about him. Damien, take it away. Welcome to Noble Nerds, where a man who's achieved the highest score in no less than four Pac-Man arcade machines tells you about other truly great people. Today's noble nerd is famed Nazi scientist and proof that even the Nobel Committee isn't perfect, Philip Leonard. This noble bad boy was a German physicist and winner of the Nobel Prize for Physics in 1905 for some bullshit like cathode rays. To be fair to Leonard, though, he would have been recognized by the Nobel Committee for multiple categories had they recognized outstanding achievements in the field of anti-Semitism. As Hitler's chief of Aryan physics, that is a real title he had. Um, I had that title as well, by the way. <laughs> you, there are a lot of similarities between <laughs> yeah. you and Leonard. <laughs> Leonard is remembered today as a strong German nationalist who despised, quote, English physics, which he considered to have stolen its ideas from Germany. He joined the National Socialist Party way before it became popular or politically necessary to do so. 
during the Nazi regime. So he was a hipster Nazi. Like he didn't <laughs> just jump on the bandwagon once everybody else was there. Yeah, and he was very pretentious to all the people who came late to the party. <laughs> he loved kale as well. <laughs> During the Nazi regime, he was an outspoken proponent that the idea of Germany should rely on Deutsch physics, which is essentially the German non-English physics, and ignore what he considered the fallacious and deliberately misleading ideas of Jewish physics, which is essentially a shot at Albert Einstein. (laughs) And delis. (laughs) He would refer to Einstein's idea of relativity as the Jewish fraud. Was he one of the 100 scientists against Einstein? It seems like a movie that somebody... To, to which Einstein's reply was, uh, one would have, would have been enough. <laughs> Wish Wikipedia that sounds like quite that the article. Royal Rumble, actually. <laughs> <laughs> like, did he get a bat? Because or... otherwise that seems unfair. <laughs> <laughs> so we're really not going to focus on this man's scientific achievements, more of his terrible personal life. But let's go on to the questions. One, why do modern-day labs refuse to replicate his controversial and blatantly anti-Semitic published experiments? Second part to the question. Has Big Israel gotten to science? <laughs> I just imagine that like his, his anti-Semitic experiments are just him. He publishes three papers on how dreidel turning will kill you. <laughs> it's a cookbook. Which gets you by a question. What are some other less noteworthy papers he's oh, published? Oh, man. There, there was a lot. I'm trying to think. Uh, <laughs> the, the poison in gefilte fish. That was a big one. Um, Do Jewish whispers cause cancer? <laughs> to serve Jews. <laughs> a study on how most forest fires are started by menorahs. <laughs> I'd like to see big science tackle some of these experiments today and see if they're still true. Second question. Philip Leonard sits atop the Nobel Committee's worst human being list. What skeleton would have to come out of another Nobel laureate's closet to take Philip Leonard's perennial spot on the Nobel Committee shit list? Oh, that one's easy. When everybody figures out that Einstein was cosmeting the shit out of graduate researchers. (laughs) (laughs) He did the thing where he hid the pill in his hair. (laughs) It's really slyly put it in. Now the Cosby show and relativity has been ruined for me. (laughs) Few people knew that Einstein actually did a lot of uh, date raping in the American South. Uh, He called it his research into black holes. (laughs) Bobby, question number three. Defend yourself. How are you a better person than Philip Leonard? Not. Not at all. (laughs) Not even close. All right, well, that was easy. All right, this has been Noble Nerds. <laughs> all right, guys, thank you for coming around for Science Faction 95. Mike, thanks for coming on out thanks to for say hi me. to us. Everybody, thank you for listening. Make sure you tune in next week for Science Faction 96. I'll join you for drinks in a bit, guys. i got to go come in Mike's pool. You've been listening to Science Faction. Wait, that's not right. Right.